Hey everybody, welcome back to Young Engineers of Today. Hope you had a good couple of days. We're going to continue, or get started, or whatever your preferred way of looking at it is, on Eagle Circuits. Eagle Design. Eagle Circuit Design. Eagle PCB Wizard. Whatever it's called. I think it's just called Eagle, actually. I've seen it called a few different things, but I... On the website, at least, it was just referring, on CADSoft's website, they were just referring to it as Eagle, so. And here it says Eagle, too, so that helps to reinforce that notion. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. Um, that's what we're going to be doing today. We're probably going to be spending all class doing that, because Eagle is a bit more involved than 1-2-3-D circuit. And the circuit that we're making is certainly going to be more involved than the one we made in 1-2-3-D circuit. So it's just all around going to take a little bit longer. Um, but we'll, you know, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out together. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to help you guys figure it out and tell you what to do next, at least to a certain degree. Sometimes I ask you what to do next, just to be tricky and shake things up. Anyway, let's go ahead and get Eagle software open. Now, I'm hoping that you guys made a shortcut onto the desktop from last time, because that will just make your life a lot easier. If not, um, hopefully you remember how to uh, navigate back to uh, the executable file for Eagle. If not, you know, just let me know and we'll figure it out. It's no big deal. Also, let me move my microphone up so I'm not just constantly breathing into it. How does that sound? Good. Excellent. Glad to hear it. Okay. So we got far enough yesterday uh, that we actually took a look at the UI of Eagle, or yesterday, Monday, whatever, yesterday, Monday felt like yesterday. I don't know what happened actually yesterday. Um, good Lord. Um, but we didn't actually get to do like anything with it. I basically just sort of rambled at you guys for 10 minutes about how the search function is weird and the ad um, window has a ton of components in it. And then we were like, okay, good class, everybody. Or that's what I was like. So today we're going to actually get into making a schematic. Who knows whether or not we're going to be able to finish the schematic today. Uh, that largely depends upon how cooperative the program is, um, how quickly you know we can get through all the different materials and placing everything, and uh, you know just sort of the general tone of today. Now, with that in mind, uh, I know I opened up a schematic yesterday. You guys might have too if you were following along. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. That's fine. If you did, it probably didn't save if you just closed it like I did. That's the thing to remember about Eagle Software. If you just close it, it's not going to say, hey, you haven't saved this. It's just going to go, okay, and it's going to close. Anything you haven't saved is going to go away. Like my empty board, so not really any love lost, but it's a good thing to make sure that you're, you, you know, that you save it before you close it today, because we're going to make some progress on it. We're going to add some stuff. We're going to do some stuff. It's going to be a wild and crazy time, but we got to make sure that um, we actually save our project before we close it. So with that in mind, I'm going to right click on. Young Engineers of Today board because that was our um, that was our project name and I'm gonna go to New and then select Schematic and here we go this mm, there we go this is our schematic window now you'll notice if you look up at the top it's got the um, file path and then it just says Untitled.sch uh, until it's something other than untitled.seh, it won't actually save. It just sort of exists in memory on your computer. Some of it might actually be written to the hard drive in case Eagle, soft, Eagle crashes, although that's 
dubious at best. I wouldn't rely on that. Um, really, the best practice in this case would be to save early and save often. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, click on the little save button over here. I'm going to call it uh, YEOT board because it's totally okay to call it the same thing as the project. So now we've got file path YAOT board slash YAOT board dot SCH. Excellent. So far, so good. Now, if we were to close this and, uh, you know, reopen Eagle, at the very least, there would be a schematic inside of the YAOT board project. But you guys weren't here to learn how to save. You guys are probably already pretty familiar with that. You guys are here to learn how to use Eagle. So let's get started. Now, when I was talking uh, on Monday about this, I brought up the add button and said that you guys would be pretty familiar with this button by the end of the lesson, which is true. Um, I stand by that statement. You guys will become very familiar with it. And uh, depending on you know, whether or not you continue with this, you will become very familiar with it. But for now, go ahead and click on the Add button and just see all the stuff that pops up. Like, a lot of stuff. And all of this stuff, it doesn't look like a lot now, but until you expand it and you realize that, hey, there's stuff inside this that you can expand to bring more stuff up. So it's just, there's a gigantic list of components. And I, I believe I said this on Monday, uh, you know, this is actually smaller than the default library that comes with Eagle. So navigating it Navigating through this traditionally, not necessarily recommended. It's not the best to be like, okay, so I'm going to need, I'm going to need an IC, so let me go into analog IC, and then I think I'm going to need, a, a, no, that's just way too much work, way too much work. We're going to be using the search function pretty much explicitly, um, or exclusively, rather, uh, throughout this entire lesson. reason why I emphasize that is because there are a couple of tricks to the search function. And I know I went over these on Monday, but I figure I'll go over them again just to refresh and just because it's sort of a weird concept. So let's say I want to search for something. I want to search for the AT Mega 328 microcontroller. Let me just go ahead and type that in. I'll hit enter. There's one result. AT Mega 328P underscore MLF MLF32, which is a, a version of the AT Mega um, microcontroller uh, integrated circuit. That's all well and good. However, I know from personal experience that there are far more options for the AT Mega 328 inside of this library. Uh, there are more. There are more. Let's just say there are more. So, enter the asterisk key. The asterisk key is kind of a... The asterisk is uh, what's called a wildcard. It's basically saying, hey, I want to do a search. Give me everything that has AT Mega 328 in it and then on top of that, or so everything that says AT Mega 328, and then on top of that, everything that has AT Mega 328 at the beginning of its name, and then any number of anything afterwards. So this is probably going to pop up. Yep, it's going to pop up some more results. So this is AT Mega 328. This is our original result, and now we've got ones that have basically additional characters after the AT Mega 328 distinguishing it. Now keep in mind this wildcard only applies to characters that come after AT Mega 328. If we wanted to do before, we would need to put an asterisk before. Now, because we have one before and after, uh, basically it's looking for anything that has AT Mega 328 anywhere in the name. We didn't get any more results because there isn't anything that has something before AT Mega 328. So, you know, eh, whatever, them's the bricks. It's kind of like searching for something on Google. You know, if you put 
Um, if you put what you're searching for in quotes, Google will search for that exactly. Just those words exactly. However, if you don't put them in quotes, it will search for it. Well, it'll search for any of those words in any order anywhere. It's sort of like making your search more specific or more general. In this case, we have to do this in order to make our search more general because if we don't know exactly the name of what we're looking for, our, our lives are going to be a little bit harder. You know, I could I could put in here, see, let's say I couldn't remember the last digit of this, so I just put in 18 mega 32. I get nothing. Nothing at all. Because it's not 18 mega 32, it's 18 mega 328. So it is incredibly literal, incredibly specific. And wildcards, like if I put one instead of an 8 at the end of this, can save your life. They can help you find the thing you're looking for. And see, we even pulled up more uh, more results because this is 18 mega 32 U4 as opposed to 18 mega 328, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, I think I've harped on that point enough. Uh, and you guys didn't come here to learn about search functions in Eagle. Let's get started on placing stuff. Because actually adding things is kind of like the meat and potatoes of the schematic part. Well, it's the meat to the wiring up potatoes. That was a really strange sentence. Whatever. <laughs> We're not going to search for Fran. Um, that's just me being bad at typing. What we are going to search for, however, is frame with a wildcard after it. And you should get mm, about eight results. Got frame one, A4, frame two, A4, and then spark fun aesthetics, and then spark fun retired. What we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and uh, retract those, make them smaller, whatever the word is that I can't think of right now. Because we don't care about those. We, what we want is in spark fun aesthetics. You see this frame letter one right here? Go ahead and expand that little subcategory. And we've got frame letter and frame letter no package. You can also see under description it says creative underscore commons or dummy. Now this is uh, not actually part of the circuit. Frames, if you look at like pretty much any professional schematic, they're gonna have a frame around it which is just, it's literally a frame. The, the thing you think of with like a border around a thing. Uh, a frame's also going to have generally an information box somewhere on that frame letting you know the name of the object, the, uh, you know, who, who this design belongs to, when it was made, all kinds of helpful information like that. The creative underscore commons one here, this is basically a pre-built frame that already has the creative commons license on it. Putting our project inside of this frame and distributing this project is essentially, I mean, we would have to sort of explicitly say it ourselves as well um, in order to be the most helpful. But th this is essentially giving everybody the idea that the, the, uh, the design can be redistributed under the Creative Commons license, uh, which is actually a really cool license. Um, it's basically, it's the it's one of the ways in order to distribute your ideas for free. It allows people to take those ideas and modify them, redistribute them, things like that. Just, you know, asking that they uh, at least try to keep it in the spirit of, you know, free information. So I'm going to go ahead and select this frame letter. I'm going to hit OK. And as you can see, um, let me zoom out a bit. Now I've got this frame attached to my cursor. Cool. This is placement mode. Now we can place it anywhere we so choose. What I'm going to do is you remember this. Um, you remember this dotted cross here. This is the origin. You can think of this entire blank canvas right here that I'm currently wiggling the frame around on as being a, um, a grid, even though there's no visible grid. But there are coordinates. This cross here represents 0, 0 on that grid. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to align the bottom left corner, basically where my cursor is, with the origin. And I'm going to click once. And it's going to place it there. So titled YOT board, designed by date not saved, sheet 1 out of 1, 
revision, release under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 license, blah, blah, blah. Now you'll notice that I clicked once, I placed it, and now I've got another one following me around. Eagle assumes that you're going to place multiple copies of whatever component you're trying to add. It's actually a pretty good practice to have because a lot of times when you're building circuits, you are going to be placing, you know, like, I don't know, 15 resistors or whatever. So it's, it's good to not have to go back into the add window each time and um, select the component all over again just to place one or have to do some kind of copy pasting thing. Anyway, it's, it's good for, for a speed factor, but it, it can kind of trip you up too if you're not really prepared for it or if you accidentally double click, then you accidentally place two things and then it's just kind of like, meh. So we can get rid of that by hitting escape and it brings up the add window again because it assumes that we want to continue adding things. We just wanted to stop adding that thing. If we wanted to get out of the add menu, we could hit escape one more time, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to search for another thing. Let me think about what I need to search for. All oh, right, we're going to search for a barrel jack next. I believe I can, yep. Okay, so if you search for barrel with a wildcard after it, you've got spark fun connectors and then power jack. And if you expand that, you've got a whole bunch of power jack options. Uh, SMD overpass, combo, PTH, PTH bread, PTH lock, slot, SMD and overpassed, or SMD overpassed, again. For some reason, it's listed twice. What we're going to do is we're going to use the PTH, Power Jack PTH. No bread, no lock, just Power Jack PTH. We're going to place that within the frame, but in the upper left hand corner. So I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to zoom in up here. And I'm going to place it mm, not quite all the way up against the top. We can move it later if we need to, but I want to leave some room above it just in case. So I'm going to put it a little bit down from the top left-hand corner. And now we've got our power jack. Uh, all three of these straight lines, by the way, are all connectors, which can be connected to other things. Um, because a power jack contains both the power and the ground. So actually there are... A fair number of connectors on a power jack and by a fair number I mean three but regardless it's it's good to know why there are three connectors next we're gonna have a uh, a capacitor so let's see here that's way too many results Let's just try cap PTH. Oops. Hey, spark fun capacitors and spark fun passives. Let me just double check and see which one were uh, spark fun capacitors. Okay. So if you just search for cap PTH, no wild cards in the search bar, we're going to bring up the generic capacitors, which can be used in spark fun or uh, Eagle that are from spark fun. So I'm going to select this first one under Spark Fun Capacitors, Cap PTH, hit OK. And we're going to place it, we're going to place it right here. And then I'm going to grab a power and a ground. So if I do a search for a VCC, supply symbol, hit OK, place this above the capacitor and the power jack. And then GND, these should be pretty familiar, GND and VCC from the uh, 123D circuit. Hit OK, place that below the capacitor, keep all three of them on the same line, and I'm going to hit escape again, so we actually come out of the, uh, the add menu. So this is what I have so far. I have a power jack, I have a power, a ground, and a capacitor. You guys know what capacitors are, what they do?
Okay. Well, a capacitor is similar to a battery in the sense that it stores and discharges electricity. However, it is different from a battery. A capacitor will store up basically electrical potential between two plates. A capacitor is literally just two plates, two metal or conductive plates that are really, 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 really close together, but not so close that they're touching. Basically, the distance of the two plates on a capacitor can determine how much charge a capacitor can hold. But as electricity is running through the circuit and hitting the capacitor, a bunch of electrons are building up on one of the plates, making that plate more negatively charged. As it gets more and more negatively charged, the other side is going to start getting affected by it, the other plate. At first, it's, you know, it's not going to be affected by it. But then as the, one, as the one plate which is gathering electrons gets more and more negatively charged, it's going to get a larger and larger electrical field. As the electrical field gets larger, it's eventually going to touch the other plates. The other plate's going to be affected by the electrical field. It's going to start sending electrons away, which is going to create a positive charge on that plate. So now you have two plates that are close together. One of them has a negative charge and one of them has a positive charge. And they're close enough that their electrical fields are affecting each other. What do you think is going to happen? Well, I'll tell you what's going to happen. That capacitor is going to start discharging. When the capacitor is building up electrons, it's charging up. When the capacitor starts losing those electrons, sending them across the plate, or sending them across the open space to the other plate and then completing the circuit, then it's going to start discharging. Have you ever... Let's see here. I don't think any of you have really had much experience with CRT TVs. Just in case, though, do you remember CRT TVs? Big, fat TVs that were super heavy uh, and that came before flat screen TVs and are kind of the reason why flat screen TVs are such a huge deal. You had one? Okay. So, yeah, definitely had some experience with it then. Now... Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, okay. Okay. It was it was the middle schoolers who weren't really aware of CRT TVs. Um, if you ever turned one of those off and then just heard like a little really high-pitched whine coming out of the TV, those are the capacitors discharging. In fact, there are certain things. Um, there are like phone chargers. They have bricks on the wall. Like the, 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 the big ugly brick that you plug a USB cable into and then you plug it into your phone. Or you're, maybe you have one for like a 3DS or something like that. If you unplug the, uh, the brick from the wall and then you really quickly look at like the power there at the, the device that you're charging, you can see there's a little bit of delay in between when you unplug it from the wall and when the device realizes it's no longer being charged anymore. Well, that's not really a delay because the thing's like, what? No, it's because there's a capacitor in that brick, and the capacitor has to discharge entirely before um, the device is no longer being charged. You'll see it the other way around when you plug it in, because then it'll be a second before the light, you know, or whatever turns on saying that it's charging, and that's what's going on. The capacitor has to charge up. Once it reaches full charge, it will then complete the circuit, and then allow electricity to flow as normal. When you unplug it, uh, the capacitor has enough electrical charge that it's going to be able to continue sending a charge or continue sending a current down that line until it runs out. Anyway, in that long tangent, that's how it's similar to a battery. A battery is different, though, because it gets its power from chemical reactions, generally. Batteries store power for longer, and they discharge their power more slowly. Capacitors have a greater, well, capacity for power. They charge more quickly, but they also discharge much more quickly than batteries do. Well, capacitors, capacitors can have a greater capacity for power. It really depends. 
Anyway, I messed up. We're going to need a second ground. So let's go back into add and add a second ground. Perfect. Hit escape twice. And uh, now that I look at this, it's a little bit far apart, so we'll just tighten things up. I did. I can do this, by the way, by clicking this little four arrow icon. This is the move tool. This allows me to move things around on the schematic, which is useful. I mean, you know, if you were to add something and as soon as you added it, it was stuck in place forever, it'd be kind of, kind of annoying, kind of counterproductive, not really helpful. So that's what the move tool is for. The move tool allows you to move already placed components. You can't really escape out of it or anything like that. Uh, you just need to select a different tool if you don't want to move something anymore. Anyway, that was a really long tangent. Let's add the star of the show. So we're going to go back to add, and we're going to search for AT Mega 328, and then wildcard, just like before. And then we're going to add we're going to add the AT Mega 328P underscore PDIP. Just make sure. I believe this is the one, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna put this one on our schematic. And we're just gonna place it right in the middle. Because again, it's gonna be the star of the show. We're going to be plugging in a lot of stuff to this right here. And you'll notice that there are a lot of connections on it. There are a lot of, well, uh, there are roughly um, 28. Yeah, there are 28 pins on it. So, you know, there's a lot you can plug into this. And we're going to take advantage of that. Now, what's so special about the AT Mega 320H, you might ask? Or maybe not. Who knows? I don't know. I'm not you. I don't have your brain. I don't know what you're thinking. But I'll answer that for you. The AT Mega 328 is the controller on, is the actual chip that is used on many of the smaller Arduinos. It's a microprocessor. You can do a lot of stuff. What we're doing right here is basically a really, really, we're making a really, really simple Arduino. Believe it or not. This is actually what we're making, um, in essence, at least. So once you, you know, get this all done, you'll have a better idea of how everything's connected on an Arduino, which is, you know, kind of neato. It's kind of cool. I think it's kind of cool. I don't know. I could be wrong. I don't think I'm wrong. All right, enough waffling. We're going to add some resistors. Oh man, it's a pain to remember these. Okay, so back into the ad screen. Do a search for resist resistor PTH wildcard. And under spark fun resistors, not spark fun passives, spark fun resistors, we've got the resistor category, and then we've got a whole bunch of entries into that category. Uh, we're going to do the resistor PTH quarter watt. Uh, I believe it's quarter watt. It might be quarter width. Well, anyway, it's going to be the, the resistor PTH one quarter W. So hit OK. And we're going to place four of these. So what I want to do is I want to place these facing vertically. But right now it's horizontal. How do I do that? Well, unfortunately, there isn't really a nice, simple button that you can press like you can in 1-2-3-D um, in, um, circuit where you can just hit the R key and have it rotate clockwise or counterclockwise or whatever. Um, but there are these facing buttons up here. Uh, they are kind of like, well, they're just quadrants of a, uh, of a square. I'm going to select 
the second one, rotation by 90 degrees, and look at that. Now it's voidical. I'm going to place three here. Boom. And I'll place one up here. Boom. And that'll do it for the resistors. Those are all the resistors we're going to place at this particular step. We might place more in the future, but for now, that's enough. Next, we're going to place some LEDs. LED, wildcard, enter. Way too many results. Let's try LED5, wildcard, enter. Hey, spark fun LED, and then LED, and then LED 5 millimeter. We're going to be placing down some 5 millimeter LEDs. And that's all it means, is the diameter is 5 millimeters. So hit that, hit OK, and then rotate it back. So click the original no rotation button and place it up here above each of these three resistors. So we're going to have three LEDs in total. Four resistors, three LEDs. Perfect. Now what? Now we're going to add we're going to add another capacitor, so we'll do cap PTH, and it will try and autocomplete for you, which can be useful sometimes, can be annoying other times, but for now it's useful. We're going to type in cap PTH, bring in another capacitor, hit OK. We're going to rotate the capacitor by 90 degrees, and we're going to place it right about here-ish. That should be good. So next to resistor 4. A little bit down and to the left, but otherwise next to resistor 4. With those placed, it's time to place our grounds and our power. We're going to have four grounds in total. One under each of these resistors, and then one... Oh, these are all rotated. That's why it's always good to check your rotation before you place them. Ground, OK. Place, place place and then we're going to place one right here. Now you can probably take an educated guess as to why I'm placing a ground here because again we have to hook up this uh, AT Mega, right? So having a ground next to the pins that are supposed to be connected to the ground usually a pretty good idea. Cool! And now we have to place some power as well. So we'll just do another search for VCC. Just like before, our old friend VCC. Got the supply symbol up here. Hit OK. We're going to place one above this resistor and another one next to the resistor. So this should be the general layout of stuff. I'm going to hit escape twice and I'm just going to kind of tidy everything up, move it a little bit closer. I know I should be doing this on my initial pass through, but everything looks okay when I'm initially placing it because apparently I have terrible spatial skills. And then once I've placed it, I realize that there are better ways I could have done that. So we'll bring the capacitor down here, we'll bring this VCC here and this one here. Bring them pretty close to one another, a little bit closer. There. So all in all, everything's pretty close. Not exactly right on top of one another, but but pretty close. Enough so that we can still, you know, we don't have to make the connection super long, but we can get a decent idea of what's connected to what because we can actually see it. Um, so we got the VCCs up here. Hey, look at that. AVCC and VCC. Perhaps that's why we're putting power sources so close to the top of the chip. I don't know about you, but maybe. All right. So then the question becomes, now what? Now what do we place? Well, things are going to get a little trickier from here on out. I'll tell you that right now. How, you might ask. 
Well, we're going to start adding stuff that's a little bit more complex and a little bit trickier to search for. We'll go back to add. We're going to search for M081X01 and hit enter. We're going to get nothing. So I'm going to try to place a wildcard after it. We're going to get nothing. Place a wildcard after it. I must be typing in something wrong. Let me check. Ah, uh, I am not M081 wildcard X08 wildcard. Good lord. Um, technical difficulties for a moment while I puzzle this out. I wonder what the problem should be, or is. Because I know I've gotten it before. M0. Okay. For those of you following along at home, you can type in M0 and then the wild card. And it will bring up actually a lot of um, options. But you'll notice that they are conveniently numbered M01, M02, M03, M03X2, M04, blah, blah, blah. We're going to go down to M08 and expand it. We've got M08, uh, this one, yeah, okay, M08 Silk Female PTH, and then under description it has 1X08, so again we were searching for the M081X08, uh, however the name of the object and the description of the object have been split into two. But anyway, this is the one we're going to select. I'm going to hit OK. And this one is actually going to go over here. Uh, on, on this area, it's facing entirely the wrong way. So we're going to fix that real quick by just clicking this one up here that says mirrored. It's next to the, uh, it's next to the other squares. It's just a square that's filled in with two quadrants. So I'm going to bring it out to about... And Mm, there. So pretty close to the AT Mega. Not so much that it's just going to totally rain on the uh, LEDs parade. Again, we can always move that stuff around if we need to. So that was an M08 Silk Female PTH. Placed it right next to the 23 through 28 pins on the AT Mega. Like I said, this part gets a little bit more tricky, just because the stuff we're looking for is going to have more complex names. So next, I'm going to search for AVR, SPI, and then a wildcard. So now we got a few options, AVR, SPI, PRG6, AVI, AVR, SPI, PROG, and AVR, SPI, PROG2. I wonder what this could be. Well, this is a um, basically a connector for the AT Mega, so that you can hook it up to something and program the AT Mega. It allows you to send information into it uh, in a an organized way that is basically code. Uh, but we want AVR SPI PRG six PTH. Quite the mouthful. All right, now we're going to unmirror it and place it down in this kind of lower right-ish corner. Not exactly in the lower right corner, but kind of sort of in the lower right corner. Bam. Done and done. 
And then we have one more to search for. It's going to be Arduino Serial and then just type a P and then the wildcard. Arduino Serial Program, Arduino Serial Program Lock, Arduino Serial Program Long Pads, Arduino Serial Program PTH, so on and so forth. I'll give you guys one guess as to which one we're going to select based on everything we've selected before. What that one thing has that they've all had in common. What do you guys think? Yes, indeed. Yes, sir. It's going to be the Arduino Serial Program PTH. Hit OK, and we're going to place it above the uh, the SPI PRG six path. Yada yada yada. Our six PTH. Hit OK, and now we got to place some VCCs and some grounds because I'm very particular about it for no particular reason. I'm going to place my grounds first. So hit OK. I'm going to place one grounds right next to the uh, the MO8. I'm going to place one ground next to the programmer. And then BCC. Place down a couple of supply symbols, one up here and one, which should be no surprise to anybody, down here. Wonderful. So all in all, if I am not mistaken, that's everything that we need to actually place onto this schematic, which is not so bad. Granted, it should be said that the fact that the AT Mega exists here in the middle means that um, the schematic is greatly simplified over what it could be. This actually represents a whole large intimidating schematic on its own, as does this dude over here and this dude down here. Maybe not intimidating necessarily for these peripheral ones on the side, but this one in the middle certainly. It's going to be a mess of logic gates, and if you go a level deeper than that, transistors. That just, you wouldn't be jealous of anybody for having to try to decode, unless it's really your thing, you know, if, like, you really find computer science your jam, or computer engineering your jam, um, then maybe, maybe, maybe that's what gets you excited to go to work in every day. Who knows? But regardless, this schematic is greatly simplified by a, uh, an icon or a, an, a, what's the word I'm looking for? A symbol representing the AT Mega. Now, just like with 123D Circuit, now that we've placed all of our components, we have to connect them. It's super important that we have to connect them. Otherwise, none of this stuff is connected, and our breadboard is just going to kind of fall apart, and everybody's going to be unhappy. Nothing's going to turn on. You're going to plug stuff in. You're going to go, like, why isn't this working? And somebody's going to go, hey, where are all your connections? And you're going to go, dope. So let's try and avoid that. Let's get the connections in now on our schematic. We'll start up here in the upper left-hand side. Back to where it all began. Because, you know, that's what we were doing originally. That's the first stuff we placed down. It only seems fitting that we start connecting it all first. Now, if I go over here to the toolbar on the left-hand side, a whole bunch of stuff, I know. But you should see two symbols side by side. One is a blue rectangle with gray lines coming off of it. And one is a gray rectangle with green lines off of it. If you hover over the blue one, it says bus. If you hover over the gray one, it says net. Now, bus and net, ostensibly, that is to say on the surface, serve the same purpose. If we were to 
use bus and then just sort of blah, 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 draw, draw, draw. We could draw connections between everything. Same thing will happen with nets. There is one very key, incredibly important, and really just kind of strange but good to know important difference between the two of them. I know I said important twice, but whatever. Bus. The bus mode. You can draw connections to your heart's content. Till the cows come home. Till the fat lady sings. Till whatever, you know, ADM you want to use to, to, to like to represent the fact that you're just going to draw connections until you're sick of it. None of those connections are going to mean anything, though. They are purely, basically, uh, they're like the sketch mode in Fusion 360. Or uh, the, the construction mode, excuse me. They're purely for your own reference purposes. Net is where the real magic happens. If you net something, that is to say, connect two things together using net, then Eagle is going to regard it as two things that are connected. That is not going to be the case with bus. It's just simply not. We need to use net. Why there are two other than some sort of, you know, ability to keep track of all the connections and, you know, kind of sketch them out on the screen before you actually finalize connections, that's my best guess. Otherwise, I have no idea. No clue. No clue. Anyway, let's go ahead and net up this J1 connection to ground. And when I say J1 connection, you might notice that there are two lines coming off of it. I mean both of them. So first things first, I'm going to click this top one. I'm just going to click like the edge of the lines noting the connection. And I'm going to bring my cursor down to the GND. And you'll notice that it, it gives me sort of a uh, an best guess as to where how this line is going to be drawn. Not just where it's going to go, but how this line is going to be drawn. Uh, so as you can see, it's got the 90 degree bend, just like all good schematic drawings should have. Uh, this was this is different from how it was in um, 1, 2, 3D circuit. 1, 2, 3D circuit just drew a line as the crow flies straight from the connection to your cursor, and then it figured out the uh, elbow bends in it after the fact. We're going to do this, and it's going to turn dark green. That's good. We know this is good. We got a, just a little teensy bit of overlap between the edge of the component and the net. And that's fantastic. That is exactly what we want. And now we're going to connect this one to the ground, but we're just going to connect it to the net that is connecting those two. We get the big thick green dot here that denotes that those two were connected. Excelente, as Bumblebee Man, Bumblebee Man would say. Now, before I get to connecting this top stuff, I'm going to need to move stuff again because I'm bad at this. Because here's the deal. This power jack needs to connect to VCC and the capacitor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the capacitor down. I'm going to move VCC down. I'm going to move everything in a little bit. And I'm going to move ground back underneath it. And... Uh, Oops. Caution. Caution. Ah, see, you can't move that once it's, once the connection's been made. You'll also notice that I moved the capacitor onto the ground, and now when I pull it away, there is this bus connection. I don't want that. You can either undo, or you can, um, you can highlight it and delete it. Anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to draw from here up to VCC, and then from C1 to here. I believe those are connected. Let me just double check that. Oh, good lord. Uh, there we go. Caution. Okay. Caution. Caution. 
Hello. Caution. Uh, gotta love that sound. Computer's very unhappy with me when I try to do that. Don't mind me, I'm just uh, cleaning up my connections a little bit so it'll be easier to see. Because we want to see that green dot right there. That's very important so that we know everything's connected. Otherwise, you know, we're not entirely sure. Because if they're not connected, there's just, you could have lines crossing on a uh, schematic. If they're not connected, there will be no green dot there. So we could have this green line just sort of continuing off into the abyss. And if there was no green dot here, then these two lines could be thought of as crossing but not actually intersecting. Basically, there's one underneath the other or whatever. Green dot means that there's a connection. Anyway, I'm repeating myself at this point. Let's go ahead and connect the capacitor to the ground. And this is our first bit of the circuit connected. I know, 753 and we just got the first bit of the circuit connected. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. A little bit of Canadian coming out there. Okay, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Let's see here. Let's do the same thing down here to the two grounds on the AT Mega to the ground that we set up. Same deal. Real simple, bing, bang, boom. We've got the two ground pins hooked up to the ground there. And then we can do the same here. Hook the resistors up to the grounds and the resistors up to the diodes. And we're going to hook this ground up. It's the, it's the paranoid one of me who, you know, wants to make sure that the ground is hooked up first. It's, you know, good practice. Excuse me. But as you can see, we've got all of the grounds hooked up. So we've got them hooked up up here, like so. We've got the ground hooked up to the ground on the uh, AVR. We've got the ground hooked up to the two ground pins on the AT Mega. And we've got the ground hooked up to the ground on the uh, MO8. Oh, and the ground's hooked up to the resistors. Can't forget about that. Anyway, it's 7.55, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and call it a day for today. I'm going to ask the poll questions, and then just like we always do, it'll be question and answer time after that. If you have questions, you're more than welcome to hang out, ask those questions. Otherwise, you can head out for the weekend after I ask the poll questions. Well, I say the weekend, it's Wednesday, but compared to when I see you again, it's going to be heading out for the weekend. Uh, and then, uh, yeah. We'll meet up again on Monday, right? Because we don't, we're, we're, we are going to meet up on Monday. I'll double check with Mr. Dubik. I believe we meet up on Monday, though. Regardless, poll questions incoming.